Our next speaker, uh, Sanju Bansal, is Vice Chairman of the Board and Executive Vice President of our lead sponsor, MicroStrategy. And Sanju is going to be looking at real examples of the practical applications of analytics. So, Sanju. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as uh, has been said, I'm going to cover some real examples of what's going on in industry and in government with uh, big data. And so I tried to make this a little bit more practical. I think you'll get uh, lots of, uh, of good theoretical framework, but I think I can bring you a bit of a pragmatic view of what's happening uh, in the market. Um, just uh, one second on credentials, because we all come with bias. Uh, I started a company called MicroStrategy, which is now a public company, about $650 million in revenue. We have 4,000 customers worldwide that are implementing big data projects. I'd say they, they probably implemented about 25,000 big data projects over the last 23 years. And so we have some degree of, uh, of opinion about what is successful and what works. And I thought what I'd do is start with just a few case examples from both public sector and private sector of what people are really doing. So uh, the first is um, uh, in healthcare, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, of course, in the United States. And uh, they've got a population in the Pittsburgh area of about 3 million lives that are covered by this medical center. So it's a healthcare uh, provisioning organization, sort of a, a hospital uh, a med medical system. And what they've done is uh, try, to, try to figure out how to bend the cost curve in healthcare. Healthcare costs are rising at about 8% per annum in the United States. And uh, we have a fee-for-service model, which is you go, you show up, people, you know, physicians perform uh, services, they get uh, paid for those services, but they don't really care about the overall cost of health care. That is, they get paid for their individual service. So the University of Pittsburgh said, let's see if we can't take population analytics. You know, we've got a lot of data about our population. It's a relatively static population. People don't move in or out of the Pittsburgh area very often, so it's not very migratory. Let's see if we can take that population data and divine some trends about it and apply that to the current population that's under our care. And so what they've done is taken that population data, they've applied some predictive analytics, they have call centers, which are the operation to interact with these patients. They also have field teams to go out and pull people out of their houses and take them to clinics if they need to, if they think that there's an episode that's about to occur. And so it's a very um, interesting application of big data with an operational model to intervene in people's lives, to bring them to the clinics or bring them to hospitals. What they've done over the last seven years is they've, uh, they've got an average increase for cost care, the, the, the cost of health care, which is rising at 2% in the UPM, UPMC region. So that's down from 8% nationwide. And they're now taking this model of data, predictive analytics, interventionist health care, and now taking it across the country. So they're using that same set of analytics and the same set of operating procedures and giving it to other medical systems so they can, of course, go to accountable care, which is to, again, lower the cost of health care. A second example is the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, shortly here, what they've done is invested in the last 10 years about $100 million in building a data refinery. Two principal goals. One is load balancing for carrier routes, which is, you know, can we reduce the number of carriers and also even out the workload across carriers? That's about a, had about a $100 million a year impact in just lowering the cost of carriers. You know, what does it take to, to support this large army of mail carriers? Number two, they also run a large retail operation in the U.S. It's about a $60 billion a year retail operation selling stamps, postage envelopes, boxes, et cetera. Uh, what they've been able to do by applying data is reduce inventory and also reduce out of stock. So when you show up and you want that box to mail something to granny, if that box doesn't exist, you get pretty upset. What they do is make sure they reduce out of stocks. That's about, about a $200 million impact on inventory reduction and people feeling that the, the, uh, the goods they need are there at the postal office when you go and show up. Third example, U.S. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, this is interesting. It's an example of benchmarking with a particularly finicky audience, which is physicians. Uh, physicians often say, you can't benchmark me, either cost per case or length of stay for a patient, because my patients are sicker than the average patient. So you know, don't, don't bother measuring me, because I know that my patients are, are always less healthy than the average. What uh, CMS has done is invest heavily in uh, case severity adjusted benchmarks. So depending on the kind of patient and the severity of the case, they'll adjust the benchmark for cost per case or the length of hospital stay. 
They've used that research to fuel a set of private sector uh, software products that are now being bought by hospitals that allow physicians to log in and check out their case-adjusted case severity. So what is the case-adjusted length of stay or cost per case for any of their patients? And so what you see is physicians adopting best practice on their own because they don't want to be the outlier you know, when they show up the grid of, of data saying, what's the cost per case, what the length, what's the length of stay? You don't want to be the outlier that has the highest cost per case or length of stay because you get fired from your hospital. So what happens is people log in, doctors are logging on their own saying, let me go ahead and check to see how I benchmark against my peer group and try to get my practice in line. Two private ex sector examples, eBay, um, they do a lot of work in data refining. Of course, uh, retail is moving digital. Digital retailers have a tremendous amount of data that they're collecting off websites. One of the big issues for eBay is uh, search word optimization. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on Google search words. You can imagine if you're looking for a used car, perhaps a Mercedes, the question for eBay is do I advertise under Mercedes? Do I advertise S-Class? Do I advertise S550? What keywords do I buy? How much do I buy? When do I buy them? In what territories do I buy them? Do I buy them on Bing? Do I buy them on, on Google? Uh, they've been using um, uh, large data warehouse, MicroStrategy Analytics, and they've been saving about $150 million a year on keyword search purchases just through optimization techniques. Where, they, where are they getting the largest bang for buck in search word buys? So big operation, a lot of impact just by benchmarking search word purchases. Finally, Starbucks, uh, real quickly, 20,000 uh, shops in the U.S. Uh, where every single morning by 5 a.m. there are dashboards that are pushed out to the shop. Uh, you know, the, the head barista who kind of runs the shop has some management responsibility for the shop. Inventory level, labor scheduling, uh, delivery schedules, whatever is sort of anticipated to occur that day is pushed to them via a dashboard that's generated in the batch window every evening, which is about a four-hour batch window. It's generated centrally in Seattle. It's pushed out to all the Starbucks. That dashboard is flushed at the end of the day, and a new one is sent the next day. So this is how you get organizational or operational alignment across 20,000 shops, which is they're sending the data out in a prepackaged dashboard so that even baristas can look at the data and figure out how to run their operation a bit better. So I bring up those examples because I want to make a couple comments about the underlying trends that make all those examples possible. The first is that, you know, the conference is about big data, and I won't spend too much time talking about big data other than to say I think the missing link and the one that a lot of our clients uh, invest a lot of energy and money on is the transformation of this massive amount of data that they're collecting into actionable insight. And so the first sort of leading question whenever I go out and meet with clients is, how much are you investing in transforming the big data that you're collecting into actionable insight? And so this, this transformation engine, what I call the data refinery that corporations have to build, is where the investment is. There's a lot of talk about big data, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes of data. The truth is, we've been in big data for a long time. We kind of don't care about the volume of data or even the variety of data. What I care a lot about is how do you transform and aggregate and, um, and, and in a sense, distill that data into a set of actionable insights. And often that actionable set of insights only requires gigabytes of data representation. So oftentimes the problem is how do I take many petabytes of information and distill and transform it into actionable gigabytes? And that's the framing question that I take to a lot of our clients, which is what are you doing to transform or refine the vast repository of data that you can collect and now store cheaply into a set of actionable insights? You'll see technologies that are coming alive here like Hadoop, you know, it's sort of the, the rage Hadoop MapReduce technologies. I don't think of them as data storage technologies. In fact, they're, they're not really good databasing technologies. What MapReduce and Hadoop have done is create an inexpensive, high-speed, high-efficiency high transformation technology or transformation engine. So I can create scripts, MapReduce scripts, to take large data and very quickly and efficiently condense and distill that information to the gigabytes that really drive insight and drive action. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the delivery of, of information because I, I get a lot of uh, exposure to corporations and how they deliver data and insight out to people so people can take action. 
And I would say there are three trends that I just want to cover here in uh, this morning's session. One is this notion of agile analytics. How do you let business people explore and discover insights on their own? And what's happening in the area of agile analytics or self, you know, and user self-service access to data? The second is system of record intelligence, business intelligence. How do you align an entire corporation or entire um, government or entire citizenry using data as the guiding principle? And the third, what's happening in big data analytics? What, what are the common trends or themes in looking at big data and, take, and getting some advantage out of big data? So I'll cover uh, topic one, which is agile analytics. And uh, there, there's a real revolution occurring here that you may be aware of if you're in this area. Um, maybe, maybe you've seen some, some harbingers of this, which is end users for the first time in the 20 years that I've been in this business are now able to create their own dashboard content out of big data. That is, they can explore the data, they can come up with their insights, they can dashboard those insights, they can share those insights without getting IT people involved in that process. It's, uh, it's the revolution that happened to spreadsheeting in the, eight, in the 1980s, where you didn't have to have IT to set up a spreadsheet for you, thanks to Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Microsoft Excel. It's what happened with, um, with uh, PowerPoint. Instead of having a graphic artist put together your presentation, business people can now put together their own presentations. That happened in the 90s. It's a shame on our own industry that it's taken until 2013 for business people to be able to create their own dashboards off of data without getting IT involved. But I'll tell you that revolution is now at hand. It's taken a long time for us to get the tooling right, but around now and over the next two or three years, you're, see, you're gonna see a big transition from IT generating the dashboards to end users that are generating their own dashboards off of big data. IT's been in the restaurant business, that is they go and in a sense shop for food, they cook the food, they serve the food in the form of dashboards out to uh, end users. We're moving to a supermarket model where IT is going to be stocking the shelves with data, but end users will come and get their own ingredients and cook their own food. So it's a, again, a restaurant to supermarket shift that's occurring now in business intelligence. So very exciting times in this area of self-service. Uh, visual data discovery is this new kind of technology or technique that's being used to allow business users to create their own dashboards. Again, lots of pretty pictures. The beautiful thing here is these are not IT generated, but rather end user generated because the tooling now has become good enough for end users to create their own dashboards. And again, this is just another way of saying it's self-service and can be done in minutes, which is you can discover, you can then create dashboards and then share those dashboards with other people. Now, I, I do want to provide just a bit of caution because IT does have a big role to play here, which is there is a governance issue with information. That is, on a large corporation, there are many reports that fly around. And the question always comes up when you go to a meeting, can I trust the data, can I trust the report? What is the provenance of any data that's sitting in a dashboard or in a report? So I do think a, a very big part of setting up a good supermarket of data is making sure that you have validated KPIs, trusted KPIs, trusted metrics that are then shared. But once that is set up by IT often, the users can then go to town with the data. But I would say governance is a big issue and it's very important that we manage and keep an eye on governance as we roll out these new systems. I'm here to tell you that governance and agility can coexist. A lot of times people think of governance as bureaucracy, um, but it doesn't need to be bureaucratic. That is, you can have governed system of record data, you can have agile business user development of that data, or expo exploration of that data, creation of dashboards off of that data, and the governance and the agility of the business user can coexist in order to create a happy, harmonious uh, medium. And this wasn't true even two or three years ago. This is now becoming true because the tooling has improved. Okay, I'll move to topic area number two here, which is system of record business intelligence. This is um, a little bit of a technical term, system of record, but I think it's, a, it's appropriate because what it says is, once you've set up a data warehouse or data mart and wish to broadcast a set of information out to an organization, it really becomes your system of record data and data, you know, system of record data repository. I would tell you one of the most powerful things in business analytics for an organization is taking the system of record data and sharing it with as many people as possible to align an organization and get everybody moving in the same direction. 
to the extent that everybody has the same fact base, you don't have uh, debate or discussion over what the truth is, and people can move very quickly to the next order of business, which is what do I do given this new reality or the reality that we're in. In the system of record world, often you're taking data from multiple databases, you're issuing dashboards, reports, statements, even visual discovery based uh, dashboards or explorations out to thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, at the, in the state of Ohio, uh, we've seen that there are a few million parents that look at uh, portals to see how test scores are changing by school district and by zip code, and that, therefore parents can make decisions about where they want to live based on the efficacy or the, uh, the quality of the schools in the district. So those, all, all those test scores are now put online. They're sorted by zip code. Those are actually correlated to housing prices. So parents can make decisions about where to move their family in order to get the best schooling for their kids. This kind of uh, what I call system of record broadcasting of information, again, is very important for alignment so that everybody gets, uh, gets on the same page. Lots of exciting work here in dashboards. I just say that all these just make it easier for business people, for, uh, for citizens in, to consume the data and dashboarding is very much the trend. Dashboarding technology is getting better and easier. Still reports that are you know, exception-based are quite useful. Statements out to citizens can be quite useful. And these are all part of a system of record business intelligence solution. We're seeing a lot of energy in mobility. So in addition to web-based data delivery, I think we've done about 500 projects in the last two years on mobile devices, iPads, iPhones, Android tablets, Android phones. So this is becoming a reality and it's, it's coming on quickly. So not just web, but also mobile. The, the third area, and I've talked a little bit about big data, I just want to talk about the, the analysis of big data. And uh, it's, it's clear that uh, data is federated. Data is not all consolidated into one nicely structured data warehouse. The data will be in big data databases like Hadoop, which are semi-structured. It'll be in structured data warehouses. It'll be in relational operational systems. It'll be in multi-dimensional small repositories. It'll be in Excel spreadsheets. And the key to building a great business intelligence ecosystem is having uh, transformation capability, which allows you to federate your data, that is, store it in multiple places, but pull it all together, rationalize it, and then distribute it through these dashboards or reports. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, what you do with data, and I'd say there's been a lot of excitement around the top part of this, uh, this analytical maturity model, which is how do I project or predict what will happen? But I would tell all of you that projecting or predicting what will happen is actually not that important as the first order of business. The first thing to do is just surface the data you have and share it with everybody to make sure that everybody is on the same page. This is just data summarization, which is letting everybody see the data and you know, pushing that data out to lots of folks. One area that uh, we spend a tremendous amount of energy on is benchmarking. Um, and many of the examples that I gave you, which was, you know, they, they were the, the uh, eBay benchmarking of keyword results, Starbucks benchmarking of shop managers against each other. Uh, you think about uh, physician benchmarking and case benchmarking. I'd say benchmarking is probably the most powerful big data analytic technique and the one that gets the least amount of attention right now because people are thinking about prediction and projection. So if there's any one thing you could do, one is just share the base data that exists, but number two, spend a lot of time on benchmarking. Try to figure out what your units are that you can benchmark, again, physician against physician. It might be that you do, um, you, you do some uh, normative analysis, so instead of looking at sales, you look at sales per square foot and use that as your benchmark. But thinking a lot about what are the metrics for benchmarking and how you deliver benchmark data out to people that can make a difference, I think has incredible power in an organization. And that's why if I, if I were getting into big data, I would tackle that first. How do I benchmark and deliver benchmark data to people who can make a difference? Okay, so just to finish up here and try to finish up on time, I think that uh, the, the big data challenge is real. It's here, it's at hand. Uh, what I would tell you is that corporations are building massive data refineries to take and collect petabytes of information. 
Uh, they're then transforming that data, and that's a critical phase of this, which is the transformation of those petabytes into gigabytes or terabytes of actionable data. They're applying benchmarking techniques and some projection, but a lot of benchmarking to get great value out of that data. They're pushing that to people who can then take some action, and often that uh, pushing to people requires a great deal of simplification and visualization of the information. So as I think about this ecosystem that, uh, that companies are building, uh, it's, it's not trivial. Uh, when we go into these projects, we think about building an oil refinery. In this case, it's really a data refinery. And so people need to be in it for the long haul. They are building factories. There is a lot of tooling. Uh, at the very top end, the capital budgets for these projects are running five years, 100 to $200 million. They don't need to be that big, but there are many projects uh, that we get involved in that are of that scale. We also get involved in projects that are in the one or $2 million range. But I'd say that there is a huge investment in these data refining operations. And again, it's not just collection, but transformation, visualization, and then ultimately taking action are important. So I've covered a lot. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll get you in the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you.